My name is Julie Pearson Littlefender. Today is Monday, November 16th, 2015, and I'm interviewing Austin Real Rider for the Oklahoma Native Artist Project, sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. Austin, you're Pawnee and Sue. You specialize in ceramic sculpture, much of which is designed as wall hangings. You've won numerous awards and honors at the Heard Museum, Denver Market, among others and you were the 2008 honored one for the Red Earth Indian Arts Festival. I look forward to learning more about you and your work. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Pawnee. I grew up in uh, Oklahoma City and Pawnee. What did your folks do for a living? Uh, my dad worked for Phillips. He was a uh, uh, he ran a pump station, that's what he did. Mm. My mom was a nurse at Pawnee. Um, how about brothers or sisters? I have uh, three sisters. I have to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you fall in the sequence? Uh, I'm number two. I'm number two, okay. What was your relationship with your grandparents on either side of your family? Uh, I got to know him for a while. Uh, we lived in, at the time we lived in Oklahoma City, so I didn't get to see him that much. Uh, were you around the Pawnee language very much growing up? Uh, my dad could speak Pawnee uh, fluently. And uh, I often asked him to teach me how, but he, he always told me, he said, who are you going to talk to, and, you know, later on. And it's the truth. There's none, none of us left anymore. There's a little bit, but mm -hmm. I don't think there's anybody that can really talk it fluently. What is your first memory of seeing Native art? Uh, I was pretty young, probably fourth grade, I guess, you know, school books. How about your first memory of making art? Mm. Probably the second grade, I guess. Did a lot of airplanes. Were you drawing them, or? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Were you doing anything three-dimensional? No, not until uh, we moved to Pawnee, and uh, that was probably the fourth grade. So let's just go down the creek and start messing with the mud down there. <laughs> <laughs> Good beginning for a ceramic sculptor. <laughs> um, did you have a family or extended family who might have been an influence in your interest in art? Uh, on my mom's side, they were all musicians, piano and singing. Uh, my oldest sister sang. She was real good. But other than that, I just drew and taught myself how to paint, you know. Mm -hmm. um, when you were making things down by the creek, uh, what kinds of things did you like to make out of mud? Just any kind of animal. Get through, just throw them in the water. <laughs> oh, oh, you didn't let yeah. them dry? No. <laughs> um, did your folks notice your talent and encourage you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, my mom did. I guess they were pretty good about encouraging us, you know. So. How about um, 
at school? Were you exposed to any art at school, in elementary uh, school? Yeah, we had, you know, regular little art classes and uh, all the way through to high school. Even at Pawnee? Yeah, that was at Pawnee. At, at Pawnee. Um, do you have any memories of any teachers or moments that were important to you in terms of art? No, they. I really can't even remember my art teachers. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> but you were doing art. Oh yeah. All the time. Yeah. How early did you know that you wanted to be an artist? Uh, probably in junior high, but uh, when I went to the uh, BIA to get. To go to school, they told me that uh, you could make it as an artist, so I went on to be a uh, printer, which mm -hmm. helped. It helped. Is that when you got directed down to um, OSU yeah. uh, Technical School at Old mm -hmm. But you did study painting and clay there as well. At an oak monkey? Uh huh. No. Uh, oh, you didn't? No. Okay. That was a misinformation online. <laughs> when did you sell your first piece of art? Uh, I really don't remember. I was real young. I probably just bought it to make me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in town? or? Uh, probably one of my relatives. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably got tired of me begging them to buy it. Um, at OSU, uh, you know, at that tech school, there are a, a number of well-known artists actually who went to school there. Is there was there anybody in your classes whose name we would recognize? Uh, I think it was a Kiowa and a Comanche boy there that. Uh, but I can't remember their names right now. Mm -hmm. I know they went on to be artists. So. And in terms of studying commercial printing, um, what kind of a base did you get for your art later on? Uh, I knew uh, what I could, well, at the time I was drawing and painting, and I knew what to the process that it was going to have to go through, you know, to, to get put on a t-shirt or be printed or whatever. Who were some of the Native artists you admired when you were down there at Oak Monkey? Uh, the only one I really knew was Brumman Echo Hawk. And, because... Uh, Pawnee, that's a little town, and I did have a relative or two that was, you know, mm -hmm. drew and painted, but uh, Brummett was the only one they really pushed, so he was the one I remember. Yeah, he was a wonderful artist. Um, it was kind of a change of environment down there, too, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. How did, how did you like it down there? Uh, it was okay. I, I knew I had to do it, you know, to, to get an education. I had to stay there. Uh, but I got to go home on the weekends, so mm -hmm. it was okay. Mm -hmm. So what um, prompted you to go on to the Institute of American Indian Art? Uh, I got a divorce, and uh, I had my sister was living in Santa Fe, so I went out there and partied for about three years. And during my partying, I 
met a one of the uh, professors at their school and got acquainted with him and his sister and his wife and uh, they talked me into going so that's that's how I got in there. So you were about, about how old when you ended up going to school there? <laughs> the reason I didn't want to go to school there is uh, it's like me walking over here. It was nothing but young kids, you know. And I felt out of place mm -hmm. walking over here. And I felt out of place out there. And uh, <laughs> the kids all call me Grandpa out there. <laughs> so it was okay. Were you in your 30s or 40s? I was in my 40s. 40s, yeah. okay. Yeah. And you'd been kind of working in commercial printing. Pretty much uh, up, up to, to that, that point. point yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You weren't the only one who was older when you <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, that was a kind of an adjustment, too, right? Oh, Being yeah. in Santa Fe, what was that like? Uh, I liked it. I wish I had went there first. Because I'd have been in there during its heyday, you know. Mm -hmm. um, things were really happening back in them early days. What did you focus on while you were there? Uh, painting. Painting, and then I got into uh, uh, one of the ceramic classes. And I liked that, so I just... My painting style just kind of went into my ceramic work. And no one had ever done... I mean, was doing that type of work, so it worked out all right. Were you actually making like pottery that you were painting, or what were you uh, working yeah, on? Yeah, I was, I was doing pottery, uh, and the pottery I was doing, I was getting the clay at, at, in Pawnee, I dig it up myself, and it was, it was some kind of special clay, I guess, because of the uh, traditional pottery isn't supposed to ring when you thump it, but mine would ring like china. Wow. And uh, they didn't like me to do pottery out there because they said that our tribe didn't do pottery, but uh, when bulls right down to it, every tribe did pottery, you know. But they had some kind of these are the teachers telling me that. And uh, we went round and round over that. And finally I got tired of it. And I just took off into other things, making other things, you know. So that's when you got more into the sculptural yeah. aspect of yeah. ceramic sculptures. What kinds of things were you experimenting with in school there? Uh, what do you mean by what kind of thing? Uh, in terms of formats, like what, were you making shields already and um, masks or not yet? Well, in my one pottery class, they uh, they asked us to, uh, well, it was our final grade, and they asked us to make a mask. And I didn't know anything about masks. The only mask I ever seen was a Halloween mask. And all the other kids from the northwest and northeast and southeast and southwest, they had all grew up with masks, you know. So they whipped theirs out real quick and uh, turned them in. And I just couldn't, I couldn't think of nothing. And the lady told me, she said, I'll give you an F if you don't turn one in. So I had a friend that when he danced, he danced with a wolf hide on his head. And that's the one I made. And uh, it sold, before it was even finished, it sold. So I had to make another one <laughs> to turn into my teacher, you know. So. You knew you were onto something. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, later on I, I was going to do a 
one of the Indians, uh, they would send them off to Washington to sign treaties and stuff. And they'd go up there in their buckskin outfits or, you know, dressed like Indians dressed back then. But when they got there, well, they seen everybody with their suits on and everything, so that that's what they would get into, then pinstripe suits. And then when they wanted to take a picture of them, they didn't really look like Indians, so they'd run into the museum and grab war bonnets and put them on them, and then they'd take a picture. Well, that was what I was going to do. I was going to do a life-size Indian with a pinstripe suit and it braids and a war bonnet all out of clay. But I didn't like the way artists uh, were doing eyes, so I came up with a way of making an eye that would look back at you, you know. And that's, that's what I do with my mask now. So. And that's It'll look, tricky. Look at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it caught on, and then. So pretty good. So were you um, kiln, electric kiln firing your masks there, or were you wood firing? I was firing outside, but I was losing the way I had to fire them things, depending on the wind. I, I needed a little bit of wind. Sometimes there was too much, and it would crack them. Uh, so that's when I started experimenting, and I was able to put them in an electric kiln then. And it worked out all right. So did you do Santa Fe Indian Market while you were at the school as well? Uh, my last year I did market. Um, what was that like? It was good. I, wouldn't, I didn't make a lot of money, but I sold, you know, I sold out. And, it was good. Uh, then after that, it, I got what do they call tenured artist. I mean, you know where you're you're in every year. You don't have to apply right, again. Right, right. And my mom got sick, so I moved back home. And then she got real bad, so I didn't go that year. And they took me off the list because I missed that year. So now I have to apply every year. So still okay. Um, how long did you stay in Santa Fe after you graduated, after you left the program? I just... Uh, when I grew up, I stayed there until uh, 70, probably about 71, I think, moved back to Pawnee. Moved back to Pawnee. <coughs> um, <coughs> so when you were working in Santa Fe, did you, how did you get your first kiln? Was it an electric kiln, I guess? And, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I bought a used one, and I bought it f from what I sold. Mm -hmm. I used that money to buy buy a kiln. Plus, I had access to the school's kiln, so that helped. That's great, yeah. yeah. Um, were you continuing to get your clay at uh, Pawnee? Uh, or were you buying commercial clay? By then, I had quit making pots, so... Uh, I just quit. It's a lot of work to dig that stuff up and mm -hmm. carry it back to your truck or car. So, and by then I, I was starting to feel it, you know, in my shoulders, and because that's what it does to you when you work in clay too long. Did you get into some galleries in Santa Fe? Uh, I never did. I was only in one, and uh, they didn't ask me to get in it. They paid full price for whatever it was, and then they just stuck it in the gallery and raised the price up. So. But 
that's the only time that I know that I was in a gallery in, in uh, Santa Fe. Santa Fe. What was your one of your important early awards? Uh, my first one was I won second place in sculpting at Red Earth. I think it was the first year of Red Earth, I think. So. Yeah, first year. What was your entry for that? It was called a wood gatherer. And actually all it was was a, it was a blanket made out of clay and it was, the wind was blowing it. But it, you could tell that somebody was in there, you know. But there was nobody in there. Uh, but they did have the hair coming out, blowing in the wind and uh, carrying wood. They, with wood sticking out of it. So it was a full so, figure? Yeah, it was about that tall, too. Ah. About 13 inches tall. Neat. What um, were some important shows for you early on? Um, the Herd Museum, Santa Fe, Scottsdale, Red Earth, and Tulsa, and Denver. Seemed like I'd be going somewhere every weekend back then. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how did you approach the business side of your art? Um, my wife handled that part of it. And, uh, this was Priscilla? Yeah. How did you two meet? We was at a... Just before I got in school, we was... Uh, We both wound up at this dance hall there in Santa Fe, and I asked her to dance, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of role did she play in the business? I was a worker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did all, you know, did all the work. And, did she, she sort of she do... She handled the applications and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I know she was good at the booth, talking to people. Oh, yeah, and, it was fun. Yeah, yeah. Organizing. Um, typically, with that many shows, you're doing just almost one a month or something. How, how much inventory did you try to finish? Uh, that's all I had to do was work. I didn't. She handled everything else. She fed the pups and cats and squirrels and <laughs> uh, took care of the house. And uh, all I had to do was work. She made sure I was out there working. <laughs> <laughs> now I got to do it all myself, and it's mm. that's why I, I haven't been to a show in a long time. Mm. But you did go to Colorado last year. You went yeah, to Yeah, we got rained out. Yeah. 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 One important thread in your work has been your masks, and you kind of explained your, your, um, the assignment that sort of led you to explore them. And I know, you know, be, besides, you know, Pawnees have this agricultural tradition in addition to the Plains heritage. Mm -hmm. Is there a tradition of masks too or not? No, uh, I don't know of any. I'm sure maybe there might have been a, one or two masks that they might have. Might have some, one of them may have, but I, I've never heard of any Plains Indians having a mask. Mm -hmm. Their mask was their war paint. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's often what inspires your designs. Yeah. Um, I think you were like one of the early, you know, Plains people to do masks uh, starting out. Mm -hmm. I don't think there were a lot of people doing them. 
How did the general public receive them? Uh, they liked them. They, some of them were scared of the eyes because they would look back at you, you know. But uh, they all seemed to like them. The kids really liked them. And you wanted them to look back because... Well, I didn't plan it that way, but it, it just happened to look back at you, at mm -hmm. me, you know. And uh, when I, look, I looked at other masks and, the, you know, they were dead, they didn't have no life in them. And I tried to make mine look real. Mm -hmm. How about other Indian people? How, how did they react to the masks? Uh, they liked them. You know, in fact, uh, I've had other artists copy them and, and then go on to doing their own thing, you know, which is, that's the way I learned. <laughs> I, I copied other artists, you know, in drawings and stuff like that. I'd, draw them out of books that were already paintings of other artists and see if I could do it. And then I just, you know, took off on my own, did my own thing. But I think that's how everybody learns, biggest part of them. Yeah, and there are many more mask makers now. Um, a lot of times you'll incorporate other materials like, you know, feathers or shell or cloth in your masks. Mm -hmm. um, did you, were you doing that at IAIA too or did you just start adding that later? Uh, no, I started, I started doing that mixed media type mask, so. Mm -hmm. um, more or less started right off the bat one. Mm -hmm. You do shields as well. Um, is that a challenge in terms of if you're going to hang them as wall art? Is, is yeah, you got to know where to, how you're going to hang them to be, before you start. Um, and That part's not really hard, but it's uh, it's putting them in the kiln and then firing them without them cracking, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, are they, are they raku also? What's the... Yeah, the shields were raku. Mm -hmm. um, you've mentioned Pawnee stories and legends as being an inspiration for your artwork. Um, how does your Sioux ancestry come into play, or, or does it? Uh, I can, uh, I can make fun of them. I can make fun of the Pawnees. I can make fun of the white people. Because one, my grandfather was part white. My mom, my mom was part white. My dad was Pawnee, and my mom was also part Sioux, so I can make fun of all of them, you know, so. Uh, like right now, I'm doing a painting of uh, uh, a little Indian boy, and he's on a merry-go-round, merry-go-round horse. And it's, uh, it's on a, I can't remember the size of the, of the uh, canvas, but, uh, Pretty good size, but I painted it to look like a ledger paper. And then I've got little ledger Indians chasing him, and he's on a merry-go-round horse with his fingers like a gun, and he's kind of looking back, shooting at him, you know. And <laughs> right now, I don't know whether to make him and call him a little Sioux boy or a little Pawnee boy, but it's back like in the oh. 
between 1900 and 1920s style dress on that little boy, you know. And I've got a title for it, but I don't know whether to call it Sue or Pawnee yet. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. <coughs> I'll get to see it before it sells. <laughs> um, I've always liked your ceramic horses, and um, I was interviewing knife maker Daniel Worcester, and he has a whole room full of them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and each one's unique, of course. How do you keep them all fresh? I don't take pictures of them. I mean, I do have to have some pictures, but to send out for an application, put on an application. But I don't take pictures of my horses. And that but way you're that just way, kind of starting from scratch. Yeah. Are commissions a big part of your work? No, not really. I mean, I, I have had some commissions, but uh, usually I just make them and go out and try to sell them, you know. When you had commissions, did you enjoy those or? No. <laughs> I have yet to find an artist who likes commissions. Yeah, because you can't really get wild and crazy with them, you know, like you want to. Right. How has your approach to um, the ceramic part of your work changed over the years? I, I think about it more now. When, when I first started, I'd think about it, about doing something and then Once they started selling, and uh, I, always, I would also have to get into the mood. But once they sold and they were gone, and I knew I had to make more, uh, I got to where I could go out there at any time and just start working, you know. And it didn't even think about it. Now I'm back to thinking about it again. <laughs> And, uh, but I haven't done anything in a while. I'm just taking a vacation right now, I guess. Well, and it sounds like you're exploring painting but, uh, more these yeah, days. Yeah, I'm get. I'm trying to get back into painting. Um, they're a lot easier to carry than the ceramics. Do you remember how the Indian art scene changed? Um, I guess we're talking about sort of the late 70s, 80s when you got real involved with it. Or are we talking Yeah, 80s? it was starting to change then. It was starting to, there for a while back in the, let's see, it was 60, whatever you make, they'd buy it. You know, people would buy it, and it it's started dropping off. But I still got in on the tail end of it. Um, now they don't buy as much as they used to, but they're still buying. You know, if they like it, they buy it. It's a little slower than what it was there for a while. How about the 80s to the 90s? Remember any? Uh, Seems like three-dimensional objects got st pretty strong during yeah, that Yeah, it, it was like in Santa Fe. One year, three-dimensional stuff was selling like crazy. And they wasn't buying any paintings. Or jewelry. Or jewelry wasn't selling real good either. But and then the next year, they'd maybe start on jewelry and buy a lot of jewelry. And here's all the ceramics or sculptures and 
painter sitting over there mad with mad looks. <laughs> and then the next year it would be paintings, you know. It, I've noticed that. I notice how they buy. So, mm. well, well, I'll get them. I'll have paintings and sculptures. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. You'll have both. <laughs> yeah. um, in 1990, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act was passed, requiring artists to provide proof of tribal citizenship. Um, I think it had more of an impact here in Oklahoma, but I'm wondering if you observed any changes on the art scene at that time? Uh, when we had our store, my wife bought all of the jewelry and she she was real good at that. She could tell where it came from and everything. When she passed away, I went out through through uh, Gallup, and I bought some jewelry, <laughs> and it was all plated. <laughs> oh. I wound up I wound up giving it all away. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure they still do it. You gotta be careful, but we just caught stores in Santa Fe that were selling phony jewelry, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, You mean just this year? Yeah, mm -hmm. just recently. And there are, there are people out there that claim to be Indian that are doing stuff that It's not, you know, real. So. I didn't realize you two had a store. Can you tell me a little about that? Uh, yeah, we had a art gallery, a Western store, for about for about seven years, I guess, and. Did did good. I just you know, when she passed away, we just I just it just went down. I didn't I didn't close it up when I should have. And I should have closed it earlier. Wanted to keep it open, but yeah. Yeah, that's a full time job just running the <coughs> store, and that was yeah. there in Santa Fe. In Pawnee. In Pawnee, okay. And what was the name of the store? Uh, Prairie Rose. Okay, yeah, yeah I remember hearing that. Um, do you have any funny or otherwise memorable travel show uh, stories? <laughs> yeah, I've got a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah, we, when I started off, I was still in school, and uh, his girl from Taos and uh, his, his uh, her, her boyfriend was a guy from Kansas. We, she had a, a little bitty, real small car, real small. And I don't know, we were all, we were all potters. She was a potter and he did sculptures and I did clay sculptures. I don't know how we got everything in that little car, but we went all over the place in it. Now I got a pickup and it's too small. <laughs> it's just me. But we weren't particular how we showed them, you know, back in them days. <laughs> few stands and mm -hmm. well we do just grab a table and put a throw a blanket on it and sit back and wait for them to come by <laughs> <laughs> um, you were the Red Earth honored one in 2008 what, what was that like uh, it was it was good it was fun 
if you have when you have a long-standing relationship with a show does that make it easier or more difficult to do the show uh, no it, it makes it easier but I don't know, it just makes it easier to, to, if you've been there quite a while. You have your collectors that come oh, back yeah, and, yeah. yeah, know you. And you make a lot of friends and they come back every year, so. Mm -hmm. It's been through its ups and downs, too, like all the state art shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't been there for a while. I'm think, thinking about going this year, so. That would be great some of your paintings. <laughs> um, was it an adjustment when, when you and Priscilla moved back to Pawnee? Was it an adjustment for you coming from Santa Fe back home? Uh, not for me. For her, uh, she didn't have a hard time adjusting. I mean, in fact, she liked it because there was trees and grass and house had a porch on it and she liked that we're out there they don't have no trees and there ain't too much grass out there she liked the pecans pecan trees so, so it wasn't hard for her to get used to it and then you know we'd go back at least once a month Um, and I understand you were part of the Pawnee Artists Association. I talked to Marlene writing in a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Did you teach a ceramics workshop for them? Yeah, I, I, I taught one. Uh, everybody liked it. Was that your first time teaching a workshop? Uh, yeah, yeah. So what was the most challenging thing about it? not wanting to grab some of that clay out of their hands and <laughs> do it myself. But it, you know, and that, they opened it up to little kids and, you know, little kids are having fun and uh, they'll work for a while and they start goofing off, you know. It was just, you just had to go with the flow, you know, and laugh with them and get them back into it again, you know. But I still have some of them kids come around and, you know, ask me, remember when uh, he was teaching us how to do that, you know, different stuff. But I, none of the people really Pawnee's not an art town. I mean, you can't go out and you can't buy clay. You can't buy paints. You can't buy brushes. You can't buy uh, canvases and stuff. But they like art. It's just that... There's no place to really go look, look at art back there anymore. When I was there, when we had our gallery, we always had people in there, you know, just looking. Um, and I know it helped some of the other artists that they started painting then, you know, so they got into it. Oh, and so they could sell at the mm -hmm. store, supply yeah. in the store, yeah. What's your favorite thing to make in ceramics? I'd, I'd say mask. It's, I was doing um, sculpture of these little people, and that's, but it takes so long and they're so heavy that I don't make them anymore. 
I was getting ready to do a uh, series of Indian dogs. Uh, there's anywhere you go, there's an Indian dog. You know, you may have three legs and one eye, or part of its ears missing. And, We were sitting at the bar the other night and they were talking about seeing these in Indian dogs in different places, you know, and then um, somebody said, yeah, there was one and he was running and had a, had a fry bread in his mouth and them other dogs were chasing him, you know, trying to get it. <laughs> so there's all kinds of stuff you could do with them. And, and it don't have to be a special breed, you know, they're all, just make a dog, you know. Oh, that, that would be great. Maybe I'll do a couple of those too. What's the most difficult thing you've ever made in ceramics? Uh, I did a, one of the little people and it was, uh, had one of playing the flute and uh, his arms was holding the flute up but there was his arms weren't resting on anything so when I it's real fragile once you before you get it in the kiln so to get it into the kiln to fire that thing you it, usually takes two or three people. You know, those are real heavy. And once I got it in there, and uh, to keep his arms, once it starts firing, it gets pretty hot. And that clay will want to melt sometimes. So he, his arms would start to drop, you know. And so I had to make little posts to stick under his arms to keep them from drooping down. And then after they're done, you've got to get them out of the kiln without breaking them. Then you got to start adding, adding this or painting this and get it ready to go. Then you got to figure out how you're going to box him up and how he's going to ride in the you know, in the truck or car. And we did one, I did one that uh, one best to show out at the Herd Museum. And we cut across this, uh, through the mountains. We'd go through the mountains to get to Phoenix. And we hit a snowstorm. So we had to take that little guy and put a seatbelt on him. <laughs> and he rode, rode up front with me all the way through the mountains, but we made it. Uh, I think that's probably why he sold. That's a great story. Do you, do you typically you're not building your own boxes for things. You're just using sort of cardboard boxes and bubble wrap. Yeah, I, uh, I used a lot of this uh, foam. Mm -hmm. uh, have to use that. And cardboard boxes work great because mm -hmm. they give. If it leans too far over, that cardboard box is going to lean uh, give a little bit, you know. So I've never. Well, I can't say I've never broke one. I have broke one. But not very but often. Not very often, huh? Well, let's talk a little bit more about your process and techniques. Um, can you explain the difference between, like, stoneware and raku? Yeah, uh, stoneware is... Uh, they call high fire and it's a special clay that will take that high fire kind of like well China is, our, is high fire stoneware is high fire 
and it, usually it's got a lot of to call grog in there and uh, it keeps it from breaking and it won't melt when it gets real hot and raku is a different kind of clay that it's uh, it won't go to a high temperature like that about typical raku fired pieces is about 16 anywhere from 12 to 1800 degrees which is awful hot but it's not hot enough to where it'll catch on fire when you open the lid up because you got to open the lid up while it's hot and reach in there and pull it out and it's red hot so Wow. Uh, we're high far. If you stand there and open that door up when it's when it's ready, you catch on fire just as soon as you open that door up. Your clothes will just burst into flames, you know. So you never open that up. And with Raku, you. Uh, pull it out at a certain temperature and then um, I use the trash cans uh, full of leaves. Some people use paper, other stuff, grass, but I use leaves. And I put my piece in there and it'll burst into flames, catch on fire. And it depends on the glaze that I got on there, how soon I put the lid on. You know, I don't, I don't really count or anything. I don't look at a watch or anything. I just, I just know when to put the lid on, you know. And yeah, what it does is it traps all the smoke in there. And wherever you've not, glaze that thing while well, the smoke will stick to it and so you got to think about it when you make it you know how it's going to look right and then uh, I used to pull them out and then let them dry I let them cool off just on their own but now I pull them out and I'll immediately dunk them into the water a uh, tank of water and uh, cools them off pretty fast. So, then you take them, scrub them up real good and get all the stains off of them, you know. It's more work, it's more fun than high fire. High fire, you just put it in the kiln, you, at a certain time you turn your kiln off and uh, wait for it to cool, wait a couple of days for it to cool, and pull them out, that's it. There's no more interaction with no. it once you put it in. <coughs> um, you use a lot of bright, bold colors, or are these um, ceramic glazes that you... Yeah, some of them, well, when I first started, uh, they said that you know, I asked I ask a couple guys, and I said, you know, why don't you use color? You know, all I used was real shiny glazes, mm -hmm. or white glazes, or black glazes. And uh, they they told me you couldn't use color. And at that time, I didn't see no anything in color. And uh, I've even used acrylic paints and fire them and get a little bit of color like that. But now I use ceramic uh, glazes and uh, some of that color will burn off if you're not careful. But if you let it go too long in the kiln, it'll, you know, you have trouble with different colors. And so we watch it, it comes out all right. Other artists are starting to use colors now, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Do you um, get your Raku clay here in Stillwater, or do you? Uh, no, I buy it over in uh, Tulsa. Mm. And you, you mentioned that you have some clay that needs to be used or thrown out. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got tons of clay. I think over-accumulation is something a lot of artists share, too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, it's clay that I didn't use. and I, I mean, I, I cut off what I did, what I needed. And, uh, or as I was sculpting more, I, it's clay that came off and I just put it in a bag. A long time ago, I was able to take and uh, kind of like making bread, I guess, you know, where you wedge that, the dough, you know. Well, what you do is you wedge it to get all of the air bubbles out. And eventually it starts to take its toll on your shoulders and your arms, you know. And so I don't do that anymore. Uh, I just put it in the bag and hope somebody will come around one of these days and say, oh man, what are you going to do with that? And haul it all off for me. But no one has yet, so I'll probably wind up throwing it all away. Was it more difficult to store clay in Santa Fe? or? or more difficult here? Uh, it's about the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, out there it was, uh, it would seem to dry quicker than here. Um, but it still freezes out there and it freezes here, so, and you don't want your clay to freeze, so you've got to store it somewhere where it's warm. Mm -hmm. I saw a picture of a raccoon buffalo skull that you did for the Colorado show, and it seemed like it was getting a little bit abstract. Mm -hmm. It was a really nice looking piece. Um, is that a direction you're exploring more? Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to do. When you grow up with uh, realistic art, it's hard to get into contemporary stuff but a lot of the old Indian art was contemporary, so if you, you can, I can do that, but to do real wild and crazy stuff, I, it's, to me it's not art, but I mean, I know it is art, uh, but I can't do it. You know, it's either gotta be a re realistic or a little bit contemporary for me. What about the scale of your ceramic pieces? Has that changed over the years? No, my uh, my masks were more or less actual size. Uh, I've been wanting to do some big pieces, but it's hard to do it in this type of clay that I'm doing. I almost have to use a regular sculptor's clay, you know, and have it bronzed or... And also your kiln probably has some size limitations. Oh, yeah. yeah. What is your creative process from the time you get an idea? Actually, it, it isn't it very long. I mean, you got to think about if it's something that's going to hang on the wall. You got to think about how you're going to hang it. How you're going to cover that up? If it's on a mast and you want feathers on its head, you're going to have to figure out where where them feathers are going to be. How you're going to tie them on there? Where to, put the little holes in them. Uh, but usually now, I, it's something I just do as I'm making it, you know. I don't really think about it ahead of time. 
So you don't do like preparatory sketches too much? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do every once in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but it never turns out like the sketches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you go and you like, well, it might look better like this. <laughs> yeah. Do you keep a notebook of your designs at all? Or? Uh, the only design, well, I used to when I was painting. I, I was painting and I would, uh, It was like pictures flipping around on my head as I was painting. There was another one came, and I, and then I, I would, after I, after that evening, I mean, I'd sit down and I'd think, well, what was that anyway? And I can't remember. So I got to where, as them pictures were flipping in my head, I, I had a tablet there, and I would draw them out real quick, and I'd throw them in a box, and. That way I wouldn't forget them. So I had, what I had a, wound up with a whole box of, you know, thumbnail sketches. And, uh, after I did them, I, mean, I just let them, you know, throw them away or whatever, you know. I never thought about keeping them. Um, so are you painting with acrylics now, or? Uh, I like to do watercolors, and I do. I'm not sure whether I want to do this little fella in a acrylics or oil. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of thinking of oil. How about titles for your ceramic pieces? Um. Uh, Sometimes it's kind of fun thinking something up, you know. Most of the time you've, you've already got a title in your head before you get started. So you always do have titles for mm -hmm. each piece? So. Yeah. And, and how did you handle your signature? Uh, I don't know, they told, they told us uh, in school, you had to sign them, and to always sign them the same way. And uh, I know mine's changed a little bit, but not much. So. Do you sign on the back or on the? Yeah, on the uh -huh. ceramics, it's uh, they're all signed the same way, but there's nothing fancy about it because you're scribbling mm -hmm. in clay, you know. Right. And, or if it's a uh, painting, then you can do it a little bit smoother. But. Mm -hmm. Well, looking back on your career so far, what, what was one of the decisive kind of forks in the road for you? Um, what do you mean? Maybe a time when you could have, like, gone this way with your artwork and you went back or? Well, I was painting and uh, I was doing oil and I liked it. Apparently it didn't like me because it get me real depressed <coughs> and uh, I got to the point I couldn't put that brush down. I couldn't walk off and quit. I couldn't quit, I'd just keep painting. If I went to sleep, I'd wake up, and I had to go back in there and do it again. I couldn't go nowhere because I had to come back and finish painting. You could only paint finish uh, paint so long on a piece and you gotta let it rest. So I'd move it over and I'd just grab another empty canvas and start on it, you know. Uh, and I had, I just made myself quit. And then I got into clay, and clay is a little different. It's a, 
relaxing, I guess. I don't know. But I liked it. And um, I could walk away from it, you know, and come back and finish it. It didn't bother me then. So that's where I got started in clay. And like I said, I'm just now getting back into painting. So watercolors, I could walk away from them. Hmm. I'm sure I could do it with acrylics. Uh, well, I don't know if it's the smell of oil or what it is. It does smell good, but uh, I might have put it up again, but I'm going to try it. So. What's been one of the um, high points? I think it was meeting a bunch of people. I can't remember them now, but I, I sure remember a bunch of people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, going out and partying with them and just having fun. And sitting around talking to them at the shows, you know. Of course, it. It was always fun to sell pieces, though. It's slowed down now. I'm, I haven't gone to any shows in a while. So. What's been one of the low points? I don't know. That's probably when my wife passed away, and then I just didn't want to do anything for a long time, but I had a friend of mine in Pawnee, well, he, he came by and said, well, come on, we're going to shoot some pool. And I used to shoot pool all the time. So started doing that again and kind of getting out. Mm -hmm. And I gradually started doing more work, so. That was it, I think. Is there anything we've forgotten to talk about? Anything you'd like to add? Uh, can you get me a ticket for Bedlam? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had that kind of input. <laughs> forward to, to seeing your paintings down the oh, road. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully I'll have them ready by this summer. By Red Earth. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time today, Austin. Oh, thank you.